Hello and welcome to End Zone Focus. I'm Davino William. Remember the saying, waste not, want not? Well, this week on the program, we find out about a community project that collects food donated by people who don't need it and gives it to people who do. Hey, good boy. Also this week, could you live on little more than $2 a day? Well, millions of people around the world do just that. And this month, many New Zealanders will be finding out just what that feels like. Our first story this week could be viewed as either scientific or mosaic cosmogony. But to you and I, it's all about the origin of the universe and how we got here. Australian geologist John Mackay, a.k.a. the Creation Guy, runs a robust ministry based on the Bible's account of creation. And he hunts out fossil evidence from across the world, which he says proves the Bible account is true. On John Mackay's recent visit to this part of Gondwana land, he came in to share his knowledge with Brad Mills. Good to have you here, John. Thanks for coming. Now, I've got a whole heap of questions I want to ask you. But how about we start at the beginning? You haven't always been a, a creation guy. Well, you're quite right. John Mackay, the creation guy, would never have thought 30 years ago that this is where I would be. So if you're thinking in terms of how did I get from A to Z, because that's about the, the length of the leap. <laughs> Maybe start around ABC. It was about ABC, <laughs> that's right. Um, I grew up in a non-Christian family, in a non-church family, and uh, a dad who was quite anti-Christian, who was, you know, basically his thoughts were philosophical Darwinism. I would never say that, you know, I ever reached the stage of being an intellectual agnostic or an atheist because I was sure, you know, God was a word. It was just irrelevant. Mm. Um, take you down a few years and I picked up one of the university textbooks and uh, here was a chapter on why there is no God in a, in a science book. Mm. And I thought, what's this doing in, that's religious stuff. It was atheism. And as I read, I, I'll be honest with you, Brad, I reached the conclusion this was the stupidest argument I had ever seen in my scientific life, mm. that this guy was trying to prove a nothingness, a there is no God. And he also started to poke fun at the Bible. Now comes the next strand, because I still remember being absolutely convicted and I, don't, I wouldn't have known that word then, mm. but I felt compelled to pick up a Bible and guess where the Bible begins? Genesis. Genesis, right? So I, I studied the Bible from Genesis and completely read it over the next 18 months, making sure nobody ever saw me because mm. that would have been embarrassing, all this religious stuff. And it was radically different. But so you've got all of that. You've got reading the scriptures and you've got obviously now I'm a Christian. The Holy Spirit is there with a big fishing line saying, all right, I've got this worm called science, John Mackay. I'm going to reel you in. Didn't know a word about that, mm -hmm. but I, I'm only glad to say I'd completely read the Bible and become a Christian before I went to church. So they're sort of the A and the B. So you would say maybe logically you followed the evolutionary steps through and you just thought it doesn't add up. Basically, if this world famous scientist who we won't name had written this textbook, right, and it was all about the evidence for evolution, and then he shot himself in the philosophical foot. Mm. And then you start to say, well, if he's trying to prove there's nobody there, then half of his arguments are on the same basis. Like, there is no evidence there is a God. There is no evidence the appendix does anything. Hang on, that's the same argument. How would you know what the appendix was if it didn't do anything? It's an absolute negative. Hey, perhaps I'd better investigate this further. So it stimulated me to say, what would the evidence be if this is wrong? As well as now you're reading Genesis, what would the evidence be if that was right? Yeah. So how has this shaped your life from then until now? A, it's, it's prompted me to realize that the biblical account of creation is fact-based and any worldview that denies the facts uh, will actually eliminate the Christian, not only the worldview of Christianity, but the actual faith associated with Christianity. So it's motivated me to do a lot 
of research and a lot of fossil collecting. In fact, I drive many of our offices mad. I have so many fossils around the planet uh, that we collect on, on the spot. So it's really shaped uh, how I viewed what, what my role is to be on this planet here, convincing others about, hey, Jesus is real. The evidence says mm. if it isn't true, he rose from the dead, it's a waste of time. And look at all the rest of the evidence for creation, for Noah's flood, for the Tower of Babel. Mm. So that's been one of the biggest influences. So that's why they're always trying to find the missing link. And uh, yes. have, they, have they succeeded at all in finding anything well, between Well, it's been that? said for a long time, it's not just the link that are missing, it's the whole chain. Right, the, the chain from simple to complex is a lovely diagram. Right? And I had a debate just a couple of weeks ago with an atheist from the Sydney Skeptics Group, uh, you know, a, a, an aeronautical engineer by background training who knows very well that metal never makes wings on aeroplanes. He, the designer, has to do it. But here he is saying, you know, but given long enough, it can happen. And you have to say, well, stop. That's really not the reality. Given long enough, degeneration happens and the question you've asked is a victim of time and chance and circumstance which always does that. What advice could you give university students that are in university at the moment grappling with this? Would you just tell them to look into it, to, to follow the logical steps or um, would, you, would you say debate these people? Okay, I'll tell you what helped me because remember I didn't come from a church family and number one, I have the Bible on one hand, which I'm reading, but critically, because in my head was millions of years of evolution. That was my interest in science. In the Bible is, in six days, God made the heavens and the earth and the seas and everything's in them. And he made things after their own kind. So I could see that they weren't saying the same thing. And then you begin to say, okay, I've now finished university. I've graduated in geology. And during that time at university, People put their hand up, you put your hand up, you ask questions. Excuse me, sir, if amoebas turned into fishes, where actually is the evidence? And so the first point is to realise it doesn't matter what a theory says. Don't be worried or phased by theories. You live in the real world, not the theoretical one. So never be afraid to ask questions. OK, if this is true, what would the evidence actually be? So that was my quest. And I, I have never sort of needed notes for lectures or anything. I have to say I'm really glad God has given me a good memory and I would memorise the ends of every geology chapter until you got to the final one where it said, now a summary of the book, most assuredly, right, says Darwin, uh, the fossils are the worst part of my theory, Origin of Species, the chapter on geology. Our textbook by Professor Carter from Cambridge, you know, you get up to the final chapter and he says, once every creature appears on the planet, from then it seems to stay inherently stable. What? Now that's not evolution. So at the evidence point of view, it was the evidence that finally pushed me off the evolutionary ladder. I had to say, I need to think this through again. Now that's change, but it's not evolution. Right, so I began to think it through. So number one, the first bit of advice to the students is don't worry about the theories. Ask. If it's true that God created man out of dust, if it's true that he took one man and produced us all, what would the evidence be? If it's true we came from Noah, would you expect the Maoris to have a story about how Rangi and Papa were separated and so the sky began to cry, right, and the whole world was wet, okay? Where would you get a story like that from? Because you say, oh, I've read a story like that in Genesis. It's called Noah's Flood, right? And so what you find is you would begin to argue and say the evidence from Genesis or the evidence for Genesis is certainly consistent and yet the same evidence. Why do all the races around the planet who supposedly evolved all have stories about the world being created? That doesn't make logical sense, right? And so number two, don't be afraid to challenge the theories, but then go on and say, given what God has said because he was there, what evidence would I expect? And don't be afraid to pursue that. Mm -hmm. And number three, the last thing, you'll have to come face to face with this God and don't run away because he wants to save you from your sin and he wants to change you back to his image. And I'll tell you what, that can be an awesome prospect. It certainly was for me. Brilliant. Well, that sounds like a good place to end. So Amen. thank you very much for your time. Good. Not just time, not just process, but intelligent use of time and process. 
John Mackay talking there to Brad Mills. And you can find out more details about John's research on these websites, www.creationresearch.net and www.askjohnmackay.com. Coming up next, helping you and helping your community, volunteers are waiting to do just that. So find out more after the break. Thank you.